Hey everyone, welcome back to Code of the Row. In this video, we're gonna be going over data assets, why they're used, why they can be better than data tables, and let's go ahead and get started. So data asset is a way of storing information and let's compare it to a data table. So I have this data table folder that I created briefly and in here we have a struct and a data table. So I'm gonna double click my struct and just show you some of the properties. So we have name, description, the mesh that it's using, stack size and so on. And this is pretty much what would define, for example, your items in whatever game you're making. And all the information from your items would be labeled in your item data table that you create. And then you would basically have just a bunch of rows for every single item in the game that you can reference throughout your game, your UI and so on. And let's say you have a ton of items in your game and they're filled up in your data table you'll eventually run into an issue well you'll notice some lag in your game because of whenever you do a fine data table row it looks through every single row in order until there's a match and having each row of an item in a data table having each row of an item in a data table would be better having each row of an item as an asset in a data table would be a lot better and that's exactly what a data asset is so that you'll only reference one certain row at a time without having to look through everything sequentially and that's what we'll be studying today. So head back to your third person map, go back to your content folder and double click your data assets and we'll create one from scratch. So now while we're in here, we're just gonna right click, go to blueprint class. And then under all classes, we're gonna look for a primary data asset. So right here, so I'll click that and select this and we'll name this something like items data asset. And now we'll double click to open this up and we can assign variables just like we did in our struct. So for example, we can click add and I'll just add some variables, call this a name, and I'll just copy this stuff over. So we'll, we can add a description, mesh, stack size, description, mesh, stack size, cell value, and can pick up. So I'll just change the appropriate types and just replicate my struct exactly. And you can have whatever you want in this, but now that this is set up, I'll hit compile and save. And now you can also put logic in here, such as nodes and stuff to run on your data assets. So let's say you want it, let's say your character beat the game and you want to reward them by um, allowing them to sell items for more money, just so they can, since they've already beat the game, there isn't really much to progress. So they can kind of just demo around and play around if they want to. You can just add a function called increased price, increased sell price directly into your item data assets. And now you can just add the sell value that your character will sell to the merchant, add an input to your to your function and just call this um, new price. So we'll just multiply the new price by the sell value and just drag this to a return node. And you can just apply this onto your merchant to take this as the new cost. So we're gonna add an output and I'll just call this new cost. And for example, um, you can just set the default value on your new price. So I can just set this to something like, let's say all items are worth 10 times more because you beat the game like this. And then, yeah, so basically you can just have your characters in the game after they beat it to really just um, have an increased sell price so that they can get gold a lot more easily. And you can really do this for any function that you create and call it whenever you want. You can also do this for stuff like discounts, maybe some certain rare spawns that you want to have a very low chance, kind of like how some games have a really rare type variation um, and yeah, so on. So I'll just go ahead and delete that function. I won't delete it. And we can just make this a pure function just because it's just so we can reference it later. So that's how you define your data asset. And now to actually make one, this will act as the parent to our data assets. So I'm gonna right click, go to miscellaneous and select data asset. And in this dropdown, we'll have a bunch of classes. So I'm just gonna look for the one that I created called items data asset, just like that. And now let's add something like um, expensive sphere, just because I haven't imported anything to this project yet. So now when I go into this, I can define this as its own entity. And you can do this for monsters. You can do this for maybe allies, companions, and so on. So I'll just call this sphere. This is an expensive sphere. And the reason why I chose the sphere because um, there are a bunch in the editor as default. I'll do stack size as 99, cell value as 5,000. And we can pick this up. And now you would pretty much rinse and re repeat that process. You can either right click, go to miscellaneous, go to data asset and create it again, or you can just right click duplicate or use the keybind control D and I'll do a uh, cube for this one. So now this is just gonna be cube, cube two. And I'll just have these values the same, but I'll change the mesh to a cube. And you just keep going until all your items are created. And because these are just single assets, so you can see they're, they're their own entity. It helps to organize it quite a bit 
because instead of having a really long list inside of a data table to search for it, you can just put them inside folders so that your game can also reference them really easily and just handpick them. So it'll be very optimized for you as well. So let's say all my items are created and I want to start using them in the game. So now I want to make a new actor that's going to be able to pick it up into the game. So I'm going to right click, select blueprint class, select actor and call this item, just item, it's fine. And I'll double click this and I'll add a static mesh to this. And now I need to give this a data asset in my variables. So I'll look for data asset created and I will look for the item. So now in this dropdown, I'm going to look for that item items, data asset that we created and make it an object reference. I'll hit compile and save. And now over here, I can choose which one this item actor is going to be. So I'll make this instance editable. And in the construction script, I'm just going to drag out this data asset created. I want this to actually be a validated get. So I'm going to right click convert to validated get plug this in. And I also want to get mesh. And now I can select whatever mesh I want to be, whatever this is going to be. And for the static mesh, I'm just going to set the static mesh, set static mesh. And I also need to call, I need to call the function of set static mesh. So make sure it's the function one, not this item class one. So I'll click on that and I'll do the is valid, set the static mesh and target the mesh as the new mesh that it's going to be. So I'll hit compile and save. And now when I go back to my third person map and drag this into the world right here, I can click on this and under details, I'll click data asset and I can choose my cube or my expensive sphere that I created. So I'll select cube and it will just show up and kind of like how you would add item data tables into your inventory. So pretty much what people usually do is using data tables is they would just add certain items, find this item in a data table, save the data and put it into an inventory. And that's totally fine. But eventually, if you have a very big inventory, there is going to be some cost for that because of how often you have to go through every single item sequentially. But in order to just get this certain asset into the data asset in your character, you're just going to head over to your third person character blueprint. So I'll go to third person folder blueprints, open up that BP third person character and somewhere in the event graph, I'll just add some variable down here called inventory. And with the inventory, I actually want to reference my items data asset type, items data asset type as an object reference. And I'm actually going to change this from single to a mapping style. So I'm just going to map it to an integer and that's totally fine. And when I drag this out, when I drag this out, get inventory, I can just add. And you would be able to add your inventory depending on how you manage the functionality of your game. And it's very similar to data tables in that sense. So you can't change any data inside of the data assets. You can only read from it. But if you were to kind of like how we created that function in our items data assets like this, you can create functions to add some differences, variabilities, for example. So for example, if you're creating like a monster catching game, right? Let's say you want different stats on all of them because not all of them will be equally strong when you catch them. You can simply just add some sort of random variation method into your functions here in the items data asset that can be applied to every single item that you create. So for example, monster one can have uh, maybe a bit higher strength than normal and monster two can have more agility or movement speed and so on. And that will be permanently set because that's the data asset that's totally saved and they're read only and not changeable once made. And if anything, you could just duplicate your one for one monster and just manually create certain stats for them. If you want, like, let's say three different variations, stat variations, one is like best, maybe like best, medium, worst variations of them. And yeah, you wouldn't really know until you have a way to scan them or read them. And that's pretty much a brief interview. So let's cover a little bit of a recap. So the reasons why you would want to use data assets instead of data tables is just because is in case you have complex data structures. So if your data has complex structures with nested arrays or custom classes, data assets are really the way to go. And there's also in editor customization because data assets allow for more intuitive in editor customization that you can use blueprints to modify them as we went over over here and making them more process visual and user friendly. And they also support inheritance and polymorphism, allowing you to create base assets and extend them as needed. And that pretty much covers our data asset tutorial. Thanks for watching Code as well. Like, subscribe, comment below what you want to see next, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.